gotta get. Catchphrase. Was oh, this a corn dog thing? Top shelf where, where grandma keeps the corn dogs. <laughs> we gotta figure that one out, right? I can't. No, but Eric, how excited are you to, to commentate this thing? It, it's it's a little surreal when when I first heard this was gonna happen. And you know, as somebody who grew up as a fan of the game and having attended two of the old missile games to actually be up there, it's it's a it's an honor that that Kansas City got. It's an honor that that they're allowing me to do it. So as a fan, longtime fan, it's pretty cool. The challenge with doing an all-star game is, and we still don't know who all the players are, but know who they are. Nick and I don't know who they are. We're finding it out about the same time everybody else is. So the prep for it's going to be kind of on the, the late end. And uh, and then we'll just see how, how things go up. I think you're going to get some good feedback from both coaches next week. Hopefully Nick will be there in terms of what they're thinking. Uh, will it be all offense? Will there be defense? Uh, I guess we'll see. I have some theories as to who some of the defenders will be on both teams. So I think, uh, Gio, there'll be guys that will – Definitely be creating problems for the king and. I was gonna, I was gonna say, is Huffman one of the defenders? But then I was like, you know what? He's trying Let to. Me not. <laughs> you didn't say that. I was like, ask talk about Huffman. I would <laughs> know that he has some strong opinions. I think the fact that players care that there's fans who may have strong opinions about the MASL care. I mean, that's the most important thing first. If people care enough to complain, it, at least they care, right? Yeah. Then you, Figure out how do you get people with a shared vision for where we want to go? That that's going to be critical. But but you know not not what Derek said, but what I read across social media from people that will contrast where the MASL is today with where they think that indoor soccer was. I'll pick a year, 1983, 1984, whatever. Mm-hmm. Totally different situations. The world is different. I think I mentioned when, when you know, I, I was actually thinking about this today. I mentioned when I was on the show last time that, uh, so I grew up in L.A., L.A. Lasers fan. <laughs> we didn't have coverage, so I had to use pencil and paper to keep the standings. And so that was my experience. I didn't get a chance to watch that 1983 All-Star game from Kansas City because my TV, my family didn't have cable at the time. So this notion that things were somehow just perfect back then. Yeah. You guys get a chance to watch us in Kansas city anytime you want. Right. 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 That didn't exist back then. And so in some ways things are better now, but people are looking at how allegedly cool indoor soccer was and for a certain time in the eighties and, and wondering what went wrong and what happened, but there's so much has changed. Yeah. Since then, you couldn't just take that formula, drop it into 2020, and assume. Right. That. Oh, right. Yeah. Soccer Have Sam been- is. I, I've seen Soccer Sam say this a number of times in interviews and Facebook and everything. It, you, people didn't have 65 inch TVs. They didn't have Xboxes. They didn't have a dozen different um, streaming platforms. Where they, they, you know, movie theaters aren't even doing well these. You know, obviously, not in COVID areas, but well, pre-COVID, movie theaters were basically they're almost done. Um, and now in COVID, they've proven that they can release a movie straight to Netflix or Amazon Prime and charge 15 bucks for it. And they get just as much money, if not more, because I don't know if you guys know this. I, I knew someone who knew someone who like managed a, a movie theater and they they knew the numbers behind it. And for your your $15 movie tickets, the movie theater gets like 55 cents out of that or some ridiculously low number. They make all their money up on and that's why popcorn's twelve dollars for two dollars right. popcorn. The concessions, yeah. That's where they get all their money from, and, and they almost, you know, they're almost taking a loss on the tickets. And if they didn't sell concessions, they would, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't make any money. And now you take Netflix and Prime and Hulu and Sling and Peacock and Disney. I mean, all these different streaming platforms, they're going to release these movies direct to people, right in their homes on arguably as good of or better quality picture and as good of sound as you can get in a theater with no sticky floors and no people with big hats sitting in front of you and you know it's why would people want to go 
you know, and now we, you know, we have, you have indoor soccer, you have arena football, you have hockey, you have basketball, you have baseball, you have football. Where do you, where does it stop? Where do you choose what to do? There's just so many more choices than there was. Well, I, I don't know that I should be saying that because part of my job is to convince people to watch us on TV. But as somebody who grew up and fell in love with, with the game in the 80s, the, the in-game experience is hard to recreate from your sofa. It, yep. Fair it, interaction. He calls a great game. He gives you the sense of what's going on. But actually sitting next to people who are going crazy – there's something about that shared human experience that you can't get at home watching us on TV. Yeah. We're, we're a conduit. We, we want to help encourage people to be fans of the game. But, but ultimately, I think what, what's going to make arena soccer sell itself is getting people to have that experience, to have that excitement. You have that moment, and you just want more and more and more of it. And, and you know, I think – Right now, this, I mean, December 5th, what, what is going on December 5th? I mean, there's no baseball. Basketball's probably not starting. I mean, the NFL, yeah, that, but they're on Sundays. So mm -hmm. basketball should be going on right now, but it's not. Like, so there's nothing else going on. What better way to promote this sport than December 5th, like, it's a perfect opportunity. We'll, we'll be yes. back with the with no glass. We'll be back with the with the, the fans right there on you know all piled up on each other. Um, being able to sit next to our friends, being able to talk to everyone, all that stuff that'll come back. Just let's do what we can to support this season. Um, and if it means watching all the games on YouTube, if it means watching all your home team, it's someplace somewhere else. Let's do it. Let's support them. Let's we'll, yeah, we'll have uh, watch yeah. parties. We can, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get permission from the MSL to do watch parties here. I don't, I can't guarantee that yet, but I can guarantee that right now. Um, we'll just we'll do stuff to support it, and we'll be there. Gio, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. No, so so two two quick things. One, if you guys haven't seen, to go back to Eric's point about the past, um, if you guys haven't seen uh, Wichita Wings uh, documentary, definitely check it out. It's definitely a good watch. It. It, it was great. They highlighted a lot of things of what was great in the past, but then themselves even talked about the model was broken. Like the model couldn't last forever just based on how it was. Like they talk about how like the players got paid ridiculous salaries and everything, but the strain it, they had on the owners themselves and how little wiggle room they had to keep that afloat was ridiculous so i get that the past had huge crowds and all that but just think about how better off or i mean we're not 100 percent stable but we're pretty stable for like the sizes we have and the teams we have like in they just posted that 43 years uh that the mi the missile had launched. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Only five of those teams are operating. Only five of those teams are operating. Compared to like when MASL started five years later, or no wait, how many years has it been now? Seven years? That Who knows? Sure. <laughs> like 12, 12 of those teams are still operating. Like we've mm -hmm. had a few that closed, but the core group of the teams are still here. So it's like I feel like we're better off. I feel like talent is different. It's the game has evolved and the players, I enjoy watching the way they play. Like back then it was all about speed and, and how tough they were on the ball. Now it's a little more technical. It's a little easier on the eye sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> but I, I, I do truly think that we're in a good place. And I feel like fans should get behind the MASL and should support it. Not reminisce or you can reminisce but just don't talk down like oh the, it, we were better off in the past because it's ridiculous so the challenge with then and now i'll simplify it a little bit when you didn't have an mls to compete against in the united states so basically you were taking 
international players who were coming to the U.S. in some cases making more money in the U.S. playing indoor than they could have played back home. Uh, one of the Wichita players in the documentary, there's been a story written about him where he made more money here in the U.S. Yeah. But there's so many more viewing options now, as you were saying. So back then, it wasn't like you could watch 20 soccer games a weekend like you can now. And they're having issues in the outdoor game with people saying MLS is no good. It's not anything compared to England or Italy or Germany or whatever else. So ultimately there's going to be haters regardless. There's going to be people that have their preferences. For me, I was excited to go to the Comets uh, open tryouts this year to actually just at, at Bud's soccer facility, I showed up, got my temperature taken. My son and I came, we watched players. Just having that opportunity to see people who had a dream of playing soccer, I mean, for me, was a great experience. There weren't 20,000 people there. Yeah. They weren't playing. There were no laser lights. They weren't, the fog machine wasn't out, but it was just a great experience to watch guys pursuing their dream. And so, at some point, it's got to be at that base level is, is we're here watching a game we love. We're supporting a game we love. If I get an opportunity to, uh, to announce a non-Comets game, great, great. I'll, I'll be there to support. And I think, I mean, what Bud was saying was legit is there's anything that we can do to support any other team in the league or other fans. So, Adam, and, looking- in this year's All-Star game versus a 1983 All-Star team. So, here's – a couple challenges with that. It's like when you play a video game where in any sport where the programmers have kind of artificially assigned numbers to players in the past. What's hard about that, there were some skilled and world-class players in 1983, but the fitness level is so different in 2020 Mm-hmm. I know you want to say something, Joe. Let me just tell a story and then I'll stop. So I remember having a conversation with a Wichita wing player once. He told me that he liked to get himself into shape in training camp. So they would take the summer. He would goof, goof off. He'd come out of shape. You know, you, you guys are starting their two days and they start puking because they're running for the first time. That's what it was like back then. If some people were even in shape in 2020, you can't do anything like that anymore. And so if, if you played them the way they, they practice and got ready then versus a team in 2020, 2020 team just on stamina would run them off the field on technique and skill. There were some, if you saw Jungle in his prime, if you saw Stamankovic in his prime, Mm -hmm. There was just some unbelievable world-class skill there. But in, in the missile folded and the teams moved in to emerge into what was the NPSL. We had the Kansas City attack back then. There was this belief that the missile teams were going to run them yeah, just off the turf. Who won the NPSL championship that year? Kansas City beat Cleveland in the finals. So an NPSL team, minor league, beat a missile team major league pretty convincingly yeah like to, to piggyback off of what eric said like I, trust me i wasn't there or anything but it's just taking even today's player for example eden hazard and comparing him to an older player cristiano ronaldo right eden hazard literally goose off in the off season he 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 drinks he does whatever he wants comes to the the, pre- the preseason completely out of shape. Meanwhile, you have Cristiano Ronaldo who's training day in, day out, no matter if it's the preseason, after season, regardless, he's in tip-top shape. You, they come at the, the same, same level. Eden Hazard's already been injured twice. Uh-huh. And he's, what, 28? Cristiano Ronaldo's 30, 34, almost, 35? Yeah, yeah. And it's just is that is exactly what it would have been like. And then not to mention like the stories I hear where like at halftime they're having a smoke break. Like what? Yeah. So like that's I, not even gonna happen. 
Sorry, Eric, go ahead. Well, I played a year of D1 soccer in the 80s. I was a goalkeeper until I got hurt uh, or got sick. I can tell you, because I'm at an NAIA school right now, there's no way the difference in terms of how trained up people are compared to us, statute of limitations. So I mean, what I say now, it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't count. <laughs> we eat pizza all the time. We drink beer all the time. I mean, it, it wasn't like what you're saying today where it's train, 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 train. I never was in the gym, right? Now, if you don't, you look at, at, at uh, arena soccer players now, you look at college players now, if you're not in the gym all the time, if you're not running all the time, you are going to get worked. Yeah. Oh, Back yeah. then, you just relied on skill. I mentioned Stan Stamankovich, who was one of the best players ever for the Blast. His nickname was Pizza Man because he ate pizza all the time. He yeah. He ate pizza. Brilliant skill. But if you try to play today with those regiments, there's no way. Boys, you didn't really get a chance to answer this. If you had your choice to announce any game, whether it's future or past or present, what what would you choose? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, so, so let me do it this way. There was a time in my life where I was a fan. I mean, just fan, fan. And um, <laughs> I wouldn't trade that for the world, meaning that I wanted the experience of being there. And so like in LA, my seats were right behind the goal. It literally first row right behind the goal. You're looking through the net. Uh, if if you had told me back then, all right, you can move up and be an announcer. I'd say no way. I'm good where I am. Thank you very much. So I, I wouldn't go back in the past. If I could go back in the past and rewatch some games, it'd be interesting to say, okay, do I remember things the way they actually happen, or have I created a, a vision of that? Uh, I'm always interested in what what the future holds. So the the All Star Game. That's kind of interesting yeah. to see. I mean, that will be historic. There hasn't been uh, an arena soccer indoors or uh, all star game in decades. So that that's pretty cool. But um, I would love to be able to call a Comets championship and, and to listen to Nick Vassos, you know, the final 10 seconds, hopefully a cable bomber arena. God. With something that's like uh, that, that. That would be crazy. Uh, as the, cool. the game day experience, being live, being there is great. But something I've noticed about some European announcers, some American announcers, and some uh, announcers that do it in Spanish, like you get this feeling when you're watching the game and they're talking, like you get this feeling like internally, like it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't even know how to describe it, but you literally feel the emotions. So there are some people that can that guy right there. Yeah, yeah. right. He's in my bottom right corner. Well, he's in my bottom left corner. Me? I have an interesting challenge this year in that we we're not allowing spectators into our our stadium. And so it's weird trying to call a game. So I do play by play at college, no color, so I'm kind of both. Uh there's no fans. And so there's people who wish they could be there and they're trying to get the experience on online. And so it's my job to try to live the passion of the game, which I would do anyway. But uh, what I've had to do kind of creatively is connect with fans on social media. I'll get them messaging me during the games. Don't try this. And I, well, I guess you could try it in the middle of a comic game. I will check my phone and say, Hey, Gio said hi. Um, so I've been connecting. And so we had a great moment, which has an arena soccer connection. So we had a great moment at our game. Uh, it was senior day yesterday. And so one of the guys who scored, his father used to play for the soccers as well as the attack. His mother played at Park. And his mother was watching in San Diego. And um, she had messaged me during the game that she was watching. And so I called it live. And it was like, and you've just wished this witness park history the first time a, a mother son combination have ever scored for park. And so not only was she messaging me during the game, but she took a clip of it and posted it on, on Facebook today. That is a laptop recording of my call with her son and her on the broadcast. So it's my job to try to personalize it to that level. 
with no fans. And so we do have an opportunity, Gio, to your point, to bring that experience, that emotion in. My job's different with the Comets because it's Nick's show, right? I'm there. He, he's driving and I'm just kind of like coming along. So I play a very different role there than I do at Park. And I play a different role than Bud did. Bud was sort of a tactical X and O type color announcer. That's very different than what I try to do. Yeah, and it's it's funny you mentioned that. I actually talked to another play-by-play announcer. Um, he actually called me and just wanted my opinion. And I think with the way the environment is now, like there might not be fans allowed in arenas. Right. So how do announcers call games? And and what I what I said was make it kind of like a watch party. I mean, interact with whoever is like go on Twitter and text a question or tweet a yep. question yep. and have the announcer answer the question. I mean, it's still, it's like, you're pretty much like a liaison between the team and the fan. Well, and we do that and we'll do that more this year. The one thing I'll say about Nick, uh, and I mentioned this last time that we've been accused of being too anti Kansas city, which if we're doing our job, if we're somewhat neutral, if you were to watch a Comets game, with the the TV off or with the screen off and just listen to Nick, he gets excited regardless. Yes. He oh, does. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. He's one of the best. Alex Bradley lit us up multiple times, right? <laughs> he had it just torches Kansas City, three, four goals a game. Nick is going to get excited about the goal. He'll get more excited when the Comets, but it's not like, oh man, Ian Bennett scored again. Right. Nope. right. Yeah. Some people that do that, you know, there are some people that do that. Yeah. Yeah. He's genuinely there uh, for every goal. And, and so it's what's different about calling on MASL TV than if we were doing local TV in Kansas city, we know that when we've got the wave in town, there's people like Adam watching in Milwaukee. And so we're kind of sensitive to that. One of the best messages I got this year uh, online as we were doing a Rochester game at Kansas City. And Rochester at that point hadn't won any game. The only win against Kansas City later in the year. But we genuinely talked up what we heard uh, from Doug Miller before the yep. game, what they're trying to put together. And one of the comments we got online is, we, I really appreciate the comments announcers saying nice things about our team and it wasn't like we were trying to kiss up the fans in rochester we genuinely were looking for something good in there and we saw something good there other announcers in other sports wouldn't have gone that step yeah so i don't know if you guys saw i don't know if this is how it is in masl tv but i know in like espn regardless of what team you're commenting for like you have to show that neutral stance that neutrality or whatever you want to call it but this past euro cup when scotland scotland um got got into the euros the commentator goes i'm on espn3 i don't have to be neutral and he got super excited just shouting how like because they won off of penalties and he was so excited i wish i had control i could share that clip but you know well, and and that's what's beautiful about the sport, whether it's arena soccer or, or or traditional outdoor soccer, is it's more than just the goals. It's how you identify yourself. It's the passion for the game. It's literally getting tears in your eye when your favorite team wins a championship. And so, I genuinely feel that when I'm announcing having those moments and that's something you can't fake or if, if you fake it, you got to be really good at faking it. And I think that's what uh, makes this game so special. And so I get that people are upset. I get that people wish things were better. And yet here we are in 2020 from four different cities talking about arena soccer. Mm-hmm. It, I can just I mean, for me, and and this is my ten miles in the snow story. For somebody who grew up watching a uh, underappreciated indoor soccer team, where I had to drive around LA to pick up a radio 
signal because that's the best I could get to be here in 2020 talking arena soccer with three other guys who love this game in different parts of the country. For me, that's a gift for other people. It's like, whatever this is, I'm going to take this for granted. Well, it's expected because they're on two, you're on one. It's going to be expected. The comments will win. So you, it's almost a no win situation for the comments other yeah. than the fact that it's a game and competitive. And So when we played down there, I don't know if you remember this, Adam, we came, it, I think it might've been the same now, we played a couple times against you this past year, but we played a Saturday, I think, in Milwaukee, and then they played Sunday in Wichita. And yep. so, you know, just like I'm almost going to have two different teams. So the A team played in, in Milwaukee, and then there were some guest players and some more reserve players that, that went down and Wichita won, which you would expect they're playing all their starters against right. against guest and B team, but um, I mean, for them, it's a great opportunity. We'll see if Wichita gets back in the league at some point, because you talk about those rivalries, Gio, Wichita, Kansas city, St. Louis and Milwaukee all in a pod together. Yeah. That that, that brings me to the next point. Last week we talked about this. I personally think, this is going to be a great way to announce, and it might be the way they announce Wichita returning to the top division. Maybe. You know, so if you think about teams and you were talking about the names of those MISL teams, and I know that the crunch used to be the force and whatever, but if you got Cleveland back and you got Wichita back, you've got the nucleus right there of, of old school arena soccer cities mm-hmm. and, and these cities were I mean, even with the crunch you could argue so so the original team was the cleveland force they played until the mid 80s and then they folded and then the crunch was the expansion team that came in you could argue the crunch was more popular than the force ever was the 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 crunch yeah. won championships uh, Tommy Tanner played there. Tommy Tanner, I'm sure, has told all sorts of stories about his time mm-hmm. on the crunch. They were, they were, yeah. and they chose coming back. They chose crunch, so they didn't choose force, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? So yep. I went to, I might have mentioned this last time because um, I, I, I played soccer. I went to school in New York. I went to an exhibition game in Hartford between the Baltimore Blast and the Cleveland Force. They would go on the road in preseason and play against each other. So to get that rivalry together, combine it with Harrisburg, combine it with Utica and, and Rochester, you'd have a pretty good conglomeration of teams yep. close to each other too. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Southwest, Southwest. And that Cleveland yep. helps bridge the gap between Midwest and East. Yeah. yeah. Look historically, I know I said I was gone, but I could talk about Ohio forever. <laughs> Look historically at arena soccer in both leagues. So you had the original missile, you had the AISA where Milwaukee was birthed, right? There were strong teams in Ohio. The Canton Invaders were the dominant early team when Milwaukee was getting started. Uh, Dayton had a team. Columbus had a team. Cleveland and, and uh, Cincinnati Mid- had a team too. Cincinnati had a team, the Silverbacks. Silverbacks, yeah. So they moved to Georgia, right? Different league. It, it, uh, same nickname. Atlanta Silverbacks were an outdoor team, but it wasn't the same right. team, right? But you had multiple cities there with a commitment to arena soccer. How many arena soccer uh, teams are in Ohio right now? Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and, that, and that is a, a state that has like five different cities with teams. Yeah. You got to figure that one out. And then that gives you natural bridges with Pennsylvania. I know Huffman talked about Chicago the other night. The, the fact that there's no Chicago team in MASL is it needs to be a, a solved at some point because yeah. they have great, I mean, before there was a Jordan, right? The Chicago Sting were outdrawing the Bulls at right. the, and just like the Comets, I drew the, the Kings who wind up having to move to Sacramento to get fans. The, the Sting were drawing that many people at the old stadium. And so there's tradition. 
approach in there. There's a, it's just, how do you make that work in the right? And he talked about arenas, right? Deer center is out in the, not in the heart of the city that every team that's played there has had challenges. The sting moved out there. They had challenges. The power had challenges there. The Mustangs had challenges there. Maybe the problem isn't necessarily just arena soccer today. Maybe it's where they're playing it. Yeah. I know, the, I know the Milwaukee that. Chicago rivalry was only a couple of years when the, when the leagues merged yep. and they were, they were insane. They were just like, Holy crap. And we had one game where, where uh, wave fan Steve Squires was like, you know, I thought it was a really long game. And back then they would track all the fouls. Right. They went through the score sheet and there were 58 fouls in a 60 minute game. Not including penalties. Everybody get down. Everybody dance to the rhythm. We're gonna ride to the rhythm. Everybody dance to the rhythm. Everybody get up. Everybody get up.